Um, if you haven't seen me in here for a while, it's because since about November, I've been back there teaching uh, many of your kids at this time of day. Uh, you, well, I teach the uh, ones who are in pre-K through second grade. And you learn a lot when you're with the children. And what's funny is sometimes I find out lies that we tell our children. Um, some of them you've probably said in the car, like, are we there yet? Oh, we're almost there, and you're not almost there. Uh, my personal favorite is, uh, Daddy, the tooth fairy didn't leave me any money. Uh, the tooth fairy was tied up in traffic because Daddy forgot. Or one that was always told to me is, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. But I think the biggest lie that we tell our kids is this little rhyme. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. And unfortunately, that is not true. Words do hurt. Words stay with us for a long time. I want to read this autobiographical story of a guy by the name of Myron Madden. He says, to me as a child, Pa was the essence of power, wisdom, and status. I wanted to imitate him in every way possible. Yet there was a problem. He didn't like me. He liked my two older brothers. With them, he was patient, thoughtful, and attentive. When I came along only 18 months later, he seemed to have no time for me. I heard him tell my mother, whom he seemed to not like either, that he would never let me go fishing with him again. The boy just asked too many foolish questions, he told her. He intimidated me to tears as time passed. I finally gave him just what he needed to poke fun at me before the whole community. We were in the field raking hay, a big family project. Pa asked me to go and wait at the barn until a neighbor brought me the wagon home so we could haul in the hay. I went and waited and waited for the neighbor. He had already put the wagon in the barn. I waited on the wagon itself, but I finally went back to tell him that the neighbor had never come. Then it struck me that I had sat on the wagon we were awaiting. I confessed it, a thing I regretted for years because he used that incident as lasting proof that I could not be depended on, trusted, or even taught. More proof that all my questions were both bothersome and crazy. Proof also that he was right in cutting me out of his concern while making me the butt of his scornful humor. He told that story about me so frequently that the community still laughs about it now, some 60 years later. I find that the longer you get to know someone, the more opportunity you have to hear them tell you something similar. Uh, prior to coming to this church, uh, we were at a larger church, so about 2,500 people. And so if you wanted time with the pastor, you had to get time on his calendar. And so I you know, requested time to speak to the pastor, and I waited uh, about six weeks before I could speak to him. And even when I got there, I was kind of looked like, uh, why do you have business to be with our pastor? And it kind of stuck with me. It kind of stung that I couldn't approach my pastor with some things that I was struggling with. So when you have time with Gary or, or any of the pastors here, that's a blessing. So I, I don't, don't lose, lose sight of that. But as you can imagine, this weighed heavily on me. Did these men of God, these representatives of the church, know something about me which I was ignorant were they able to lay eyes on me and find me lacking and unworthy of their time? Of course not. But sometimes, we can let things get out of hand beyond our control. Sometimes we can get so focused on accomplishing our mission that we lose our humanity. We don't have to think back very far. Watch any television news program that's supposed to be an open debate, and you'll see how quickly that discussion turns into an abrasive, argumentative cacophony of nonsense. Or you can turn on the news to see any of the recent violence that we've witnessed, 
and you'll see one side excusing the violence of another because they were provoked in one way or the other, or introspectively and ultimately uncomfortable, we can see it in our own lives when we reflect on those occasions when we give into our anger, our bitterness, our own self-righteousness. The good news is that Jesus tells us that we have become a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. After all, that is what the Sermon on the Mount is about. We are becoming people who exemplify humility, empathy, obedience. We are people who are merciful, pure, and peaceful. We are to become a community who forgives because we have been forgiven. We are to be a community who seeks righteousness because righteousness has been granted to us. Listen to what Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of, our, of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. How many of us live a peaceful and quiet life? Or how many of us run around out of fear, out of obligation, out of worrying about being successful or leaving, living up to our potential. Please understand the confidence with which this is written. A peaceful and quiet, godly life is dignified, is good and pleasing. But, as I have said, sometimes we can let things get out of hand and beyond our control. Sometimes we can get focused on accomplishing our mission that we lose our humanity. Sometimes, rather than serving as ministers of reconciliation, we are obstructive. Sometimes disciples can be a hindrance to the kingdom. And that's exactly what happens in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. And that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. It reads, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. There are many reasons that I, I love being at Living Stones. Uh, I've been here for about 10 years, and uh, I've served as a deacon, as a pastoral intern, as an adult Sunday school uh, leader, but I've also served as a children's uh, uh, teacher, and that to me has been the most profound place to learn, because serving children will humble you. It has certainly made me consider things that I've not thought of before. And so I want to review this passage in Luke while also sharing some things that I have learned while serving in the children's ministry. So please understand, it wasn't long after Jesus started his ministry where people were following him. Luke gives us so many examples of people seeking him out. We have lepers who want to be healed, the blind that want to see, the people who can't walk want to walk again. And so the disciples kind of feel like very protective over Jesus. And so when people want his attention, they're going to want to protect Jesus. And so when people are bringing children to him, understand in this day and age, children were seen as a nuisance. Why would Jesus want to spend his time with children? He's got more important things to do. But unlike the Pharisees, Jesus ate with sinners. He offered them grace and compassion. He was a sight to behold and people wanted to be around him. His personality was attractive. That's one thing that I've had to learn with the children is they understand which of our personalities are attractive and which ones are not. 
and how they respond. In Mark, Jesus' response says this, and they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. Indignant, sorry. This is a strong and powerful word for anger stemming from unfair treatment. When we read of this account, I know that memory recalls illustrations that I saw as a child that Jesus had children crawling over him, sitting in his lap, and that was very reassuring as a child to see that, yes, even I can be important to Jesus. But I think we get removed from that illustration as we grow older, and we can start to see how we identify with the disciples. Because if you're like me, you're very busy, you have a lot of things to juggle, And sometimes the kids will come to you and you're like, hold on, let me finish this. This is more important. And sometimes we can do this in the church. Now, before I continue, I'm going to talk about four ways that we can be hindrances to children in our church. But I want to use it as not a warning, but encouragement. Because I want to tell you, when I'm back there with kids who are between the ages of four and eight, Their understanding of Scripture and the truths about Jesus is really good. And they're not just getting it at church, they're getting it at home. And so, parents, I want to thank you for that and I want to applaud you for that because I am astounded at some of the things that I hear about from these children. But sometimes our pride can get in the way. In verse 15, there were parents bringing their infants to Jesus. The disciples rebuke them. Jesus rejects this rebuke and encourages the parents to bring their children to him. Then, as if to warn the disciples, he says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. In other words, when Jesus sees a disciple hindering a child from coming to him, he sees someone who is in danger of missing the kingdom because of pride. Have you ever heard that if you have to take a lot of words and a lot of language to explain something, you may not understand it very well yourself? Well, children don't have time for that. And so (laughs) I've learned in time that I have to really understand what I believe and what Scripture says in order to tell the child in very simple terms. And that takes patience, a lot of patience. For instance... Last week, we were talking about salt and light. And so one of the illustrations in the lesson plan was, what's your favorite salty food? And they'll not only tell you their favorite salty food, but they'll tell you why they liked it. They'll tell you their parents' favorite salty food. They'll tell you their cat's favorite salty food. They'll tell you their favorite sweets. I don't like salty food. Uh, I don't like pizza. I've never had food. You know, they come up with a bunch of funny things. And we're given this lesson plan, and we want to go through the lesson plan. We've got time, kids. Let's stop talking. It's not the way to respond to them, I've learned. What they want to know is that you hear them. So, we've started taking the time to get down and just listen to what they have to say. And they say the funniest things. But they also share things with you that they may not otherwise tell you. There's an instance a few weeks back where I had to get on one kid just to settle down. He's a bit rambunctious. And I get down and I say, do you know why we're here? Do you know why I'm here? Do you know why Miss Ashley is here? Do you know why Miss April is here? He says, because you have to be. I said, no. Because we love you. And he looked at me. He says, you love me? I said, yeah, I do. He said, good, I need somebody to love me. So teaching in the children's department has really taught me patience. There's such a close connection between our own ability to be humble and to take the time to teach people who don't quite understand or don't quite have it figured out. And it prepares us because think of all the times that Jesus explained stuff to us. Think of all the times that Jesus explained things to the disciples. They just didn't get it. Even in this section of Scripture, they didn't get it. Another 
uh, hindrance to, to bringing, to sharing the gospel with children is parental unbelief. Now, I, like I said, our parents are great. The children are being taught very well. But we have to acknowledge that their friends and their friends' parents may not be believers. And so when a child's parents are not believers, the child is at an extraordinary disadvantage. There is no one at home to bring them to Jesus. There are some children in our church and many of our neighborhood who live in these tragic circumstances, especially when we have these, uh, like the, 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 the spring fling, and we're bringing in new, new families. We may not, they, they, they may not have uh, parents who believe. But it would be far more effective for the child and and beneficial for the parents if we could lead the parents into the presence of Jesus at the same time. And so that's why we have things like discipleship classes, uh, our our Sunday school classes, our small groups, because the idea is we want to equip parents to not only teach their children, which they seem to be doing a wonderful job, but to also reach out into the community. We want to provide, we want to provide an accurate theology, a deep theology, which prevents the third hindrance, which is a lack of deep theology, a lack of accurate theology. It takes as much more understanding of a biblical doctrine to teach it to children than it does to teach it to adults. Because with adults, if you say something, they can come back to you, I don't quite understand that, let's talk about it. A child may not be able to say, I don't understand. They may be fearful of saying that. So if you understand a thing well, you can usually make it plain for ordinary people and children. But if you are fuzzy in your own understanding, you will generally be overly complex in your explanation. A great hindrance to the salvation and the growth of our children is the weakness of our own grasp of the full range of biblical truth and the unity of the whole counsel of God. I am overwhelmed at what children can absorb. Uh, We're going through a program right now where we're teaching, we're going through the Bible and we're, we're giving them Bibles to look at, to open up, to understand why we have an Old Testament, why we have a New Testament. They're starting to not only find the books, but now they can distinguish between what a chapter has said, heading is as opposed to a verse heading. And then they're reading the scripture. And if you've ever heard a child read from the Bible, it will warm your heart. Because you, you see it have an effect on them. You see their, their mind grasping it. You see their countenance change. So the best way to remove this hindrance of of a lack of of deep theology and understanding is to help all the adults in our church get excited about the joy of knowing God and growing in their understanding of his character and ways. Here we need to help our own Bible studies and perhaps teach and train as many who are willing in the great truths of Scripture and how to share them. Like I said, When I'm with your children, I'm hearing them say things to me, an understanding of Scripture, an understanding of Jesus and how God works that we didn't necessarily go over, so they're learning it at home. And one of the hindrances that we have is a lack of discipline training. So I want to encourage you to keep up the good work, because as parents, We use the church as a a place of community, of a place of encouragement, of equipping one another. But we want to see that continue. What I have in mind is the fact that we often fail to teach our children, not just because we lack understanding of what needs to be taught, because sometimes we fail to take the time to plan and teach. And so I want to encourage you all to to, to not use the church just as the sole uh, way in which they're taught of Scripture, of God, but it's supplemental. We encourage, we want to equip one another to be witnesses, to be uh, ministers of the reconciliation. We've tried, and I think we've been fairly successful in cultivating a church in which parents do not neglect the duty of thinking That is their responsibility to teach their children. And I want to thank you for that as as one of the many teachers there because we are a community of believers. Going back to what I said previously, though, words can be very hurtful. 
And you see it in, in, in the children's faces when they can be rude to one another. And I'm talking about my own kids. I've got four of them. And uh, the, the youngest one can't talk yet. And that's good right now. Because the, the, the other three are just so fiercely competitive with uh, talking to one another. But it brings me such joy to know that one day I'm sitting on the couch with, with Bailey. And this is a few years ago. And we're watching some kind of television show about kings. And I look over, and she, she says, Daddy, we don't have kings, do we? I said, no, we have a president. I said, do you know why we don't have kings? Because I want to give her a, a, a history lesson on the American Revolution. And she says, because Jesus is our king. Okay, well, you just taught me something, sweetheart. Thank you. You, you taught me that you're getting good instruction at church and that me and, and, and your mommy aren't failing you. Because we worry about that as parents, don't we? I'm 41 years old, and the amount of trash that comes to our children these days is nowhere comparable to how easy we had it. All you have to do is say that you're a Christian online, and every, you get so much nonsense thrown at you. Everybody's questioning your beliefs. Everybody's putting you down for it. And so we need to understand that that's the culture that our children are going to be facing. That's why we try to teach them here, so they're grounded in their faith, so that they know the word of God. So parents, I just wanted to take this time to thank you. Many of you, most of you, all of you probably are doing wonderful jobs from what we can tell. Your children are kind. They're sweet. And we try to be as humble and as patient with them as possible. So I want to take this time to pray. And then when I do, uh, we'll be dismissed. But I want to pray for you as parents, and I want to pray for our church. I want to pray for your children. Because they are the uh, next generation. And we're only going to be as effective as a church as we are as parents in preparing them for what they're going to face as they grow older. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you provide scripture for us that shows when even those that were in community with you failed to understand where they needed to be rebuked, Lord, because it provides teaching for us to see where we might fall short. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the leadership that you've provided. I thank you for the community of believers that we have here. I thank you for the children that I get to, to be with each week, that I, I, I help can teach them a, a little bit more about you. I thank you for the parents and the time that they have taken to instruct their children so well. Lord, and I just ask for your grace and your mercy for the times that we say things that we shouldn't say, for when we're impatient, when we should be patient, and when we're not humble enough with our children, Lord. But Lord, I ask that Living Stones is a place where we are constantly equipping one another and our parents to shepherd children, to teach them about you, Lord. Because without you, there's nothing else. And in Jesus' name, we pray this prayer. Amen.